Um, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. Um, I'll start with a few words of introduction, start to, or try to motivate the topic, explain why I think it is important. Then describe what, what I mean by uh, leakage certification, and of course, in particular, easy leakage certification. And the rest of the talk will be mainly experiments, uh, first simulations, then unprotected software, then masked hardware, and finally conclusion. So what's the story? I think this is a picture you more or less all know, right? This is standard DPA. So this is what we do when we try to recover some information about, for example, a block cipher execution. So we have an Xbox at the beginning. I have problems with this. So Xbox at the beginning. And uh, well, if you, if you look at these attacks, what's important is that there are many steps involved. So typically, you will need some kind of measurements and pre-processing so that you acquire data that is as informative as, as possible. And then you will have some kind of prediction and modeling, which is essentially where you try to, to guess something about the internal values of your implementation and to connect this with the physical leakages. And then there's usually an exploitation phase where you essentially compare all your key dependent predictions with the actual the true leakages that you measured. And this will give you some information about the subkey. And if this is not enough, and that will be the, the next talk, uh, you can do post-processing and start to do enumeration or key rank estimation. And in this talk, I will just focus on this tiny little part, which is model how, how to model the physical function. And I will first try to, to argue why, why I think this is important. And for this purpose, uh, I think we can restart from this notation, which is, which is the model. And what's important here is that when you look at this model, you have some how-to hypothesis that we make. One is explicit, right? We make a hypothesis about the key, and that's what we want to recover. But somehow there's also an implicit assumption about the model, right? About how the, the, the device behaves physically. And of course, if we want to extract all the information, or if you're an evaluation lab and you want to do a good evaluation, you need the model ideally to be perfect so that you can really have yeah, perfect maximum likelihood attacks. So how do we deal with that? For the keys, it's easy, right? When you do an attack, you try them all because it's usually a subkey, it's something that you can test. But I would say, if you, if you think about the model, that's much more difficult, right? How can you try all the possible physical models for your implementation? Um, and that, I think, relates more or less to a talk that uh, Matthias Wagner gave a couple of years ago at Cosette, where he said, okay, you, look, you have all these attacks that we publish at the literature and there's no way an evaluation lab tests all of them. This is just too long. So we need to find a way to restrict that. And here, essentially, we try to contribute a little bit to this, this problem, right? Try to find a way to not try all these physical models, but a couple of, of relevant ones. And of course, if you do that, then the question behaves, how can we be sure that the model is good enough? And um, well, if you're suspicious, you can also always say, well, but, but OK, this is nice in theory. It's a good question. But maybe it just never happens that we have a, a bad model. And I would argue that it happens essentially all the time. right? And I think it's, it's easy to see. Each time you have a model that performs better than another one, that's exactly the situation where we are here. So that was an example where I plotted the success rate of, of an attack. It was just a combinatorial S-box, but in this case, for example, CPA with Hemingway leakage model was not good at all. So if you had stopped there, the conclusion could have been, oh, the device looks secure, but in fact, no, it was just a bad model. So what we did afterwards is linear regression with linear basis, better, and then Gaussian templates, better. And of course, you can say, well, we know Gaussian templates are very powerful, so maybe we can stop there, but how, how do we know after all? Right? And I guess, if you take an unprotected device, most of the time Gaussian templates are good enough, but if you take something masked, if you, yeah, just the previous talk, probably the leakage distribution is not just Gaussian. It's a Gaussian mixture, it's something else. So again, how to be sure um, the model is good enough. And if we care about good enough model, we can first ask ourselves, okay, what would be the optimal model? And that's exactly what we will never find in reality. So the optimal model would be the situation where I have a blue chip distribution, this is the thing I don't know. I have no analy analytical formula for that, but this is something that I can measure. And I will use the word sample. So you can get sample distribution, get new measurements, but you don't know exactly how it behaves. And this is your estimated model in red. 
a model is perfect, obviously, if your estimated model exactly corresponds to the true chip distribution. So as I said, this is not going to happen because we don't know this blue chip distribution. So theory would say essentially we could have something nice like a model is epsilon close to optimal if some statistical distance between the estimated model and the true chip distribution is bounded by epsilon. And in fact, that would be very nice, right? If we, if we had that, that would be extremely convenient because this epsilon would exactly tell us how much do we lose in terms of information or eventually in terms of success rate if we don't use the optimal model. Problem is, we didn't change much because I still don't know this blue chip distribution, so how can I compute the distance between an estimation and something I, I do not know? It doesn't look easy. So that was um, the problem, or essentially what, what we tried to solve with this uh, certification paper. And I think the key idea that, that we try to exploit is if we want to, to see something about this issue, we need to distinguish two types of errors that we can have in the model. One is estimation errors, so you just don't have enough measurements, and one is assumption errors. You assume your distribution is Gaussian, and it's not. And of course, we call that estimation errors. They are relatively kind type of errors because this is something that always decreases if you measure more. And now I'll just try to give you some intuition why this distinction between estimation errors and assumption errors tell you something about whether your model is good or not. So imagine this is, sorry. so this is a true leakage distribution, and this is something we do not know, right? It's in blue. But what I can do is I can build a model for that, and then I can sample the model and the true chip distribution, and I find something like that after N0 samples. So in red, we have the model samples. In blue, you have the, the true chip samples, and I'm asking you whether this model is good in predicting the chip. So I don't know for you, for me, it, it doesn't look easy to answer. Essentially, I don't know why. Because at this point, my number of samples is not sufficient. So what happens here is estimation errors dominate. And what this tells you is usually you just need to measure more. But if you do, and you take N1 samples that are much larger, you will eventually end up with this type of thing. So my red curve is my, my Gaussian assumption for the model. The blue curve is my true leakage distribution. And I think it's easy to see here that your model is not good. The model is, is not exactly predicting what we have, so we, we lose information. And, and that means, really, if you have this situation, you need another model because it's likely that you lose a significant amount of information. So what's nice is that this reasoning tells us more or less what we could define as a good, good enough model. And essentially, it's a model for which the assumption errors are small in front of the estimation errors, given the number of measurements that you made. OK, so concretely, how does it work? Essentially, what we will try to do is more or less the same as previously, but the, the, the very important parameter is this n here, right? It's essentially telling whether the model is good, I'm not able to do. But telling whether the model is good given a number of measurements that I make, this is now possible. So I do the same. I'm going to do that taking advantage of cross-validation, which just means I try to make efficient use of my measurements. So each time I have a set of measurements, I take most of the samples to build a model, one part of the sample to test the model, and I will like, just, just do cross-validation to exploit all the samples for testing. And eventually, the important thing is we will output a p-value. That depends on n. And as usual, a small p will indicate that most likely the model that we are looking at is not correct. And I think that's pretty much what we want. And the, the very cool thing is that this end is something like it's the evaluation lab limit. If you're an evaluation lab and you tell yourself, I have money to make one week of measurement, this is your end. You have one week of measurement. But given this week of measurement, you want to be sure that you, you exploited this information properly. And, and that's what we do here, right? You build a model and you test whether the model is good enough. It will never tell you the model is perfect, and most likely the model is still incorrect. What it tells you is that given you have only one week of measurement, you can try to improve the model, but it's useless because all the improvements that you can have, they will be hidden by estimation errors anyway. And yeah, there's of course a drawback. The, the big drawback of this approach is it's extremely expensive because we need to characterize all the sampling distributions of, of the model. So, doing this, this approach was, was quite long. At least that was the main criticism that we got. So we tried to 
find a way to simplify this and do it in, doing it in a completely sound manner is, is not, not very easy. So easy certification, very simply stated, the, the idea that we wanted to use is rather than comparing distributions, which is long and difficult, why not comparing moments? And then it's, it's very simple. I have my estimated model. I pick up n samples from this. I estimated a moment of order d. I do the same with the true chip distribution. I pick up n samples, which means I measure n times. I estimate the moment, and I test equality between these moments. So what is, what is good? I think it, yeah, the big plus is it can be done with very simple univariate tests that probably everybody in the, the, the audience has been using, right? Like typically t-test if you make a, a Gaussian assumption or something you can go for higher order testing of, of the moments, but given the number of sam samples that we usually have and, and uh, central limit theorem, this is probably good enough. The big minus, obviously, is this theoretical sound? No, because it's, it's, it exists. Like you can find two distributions. They are different, but their moments are exactly the same. So is it a problem? Um, I would say maybe counterexamples that we are aware of, they, they look quite involved, and I'm not sure they exist in the literature, or they, they, will, they, they will correspond to, to what we have in practice. Um, also, if you look at what we do, concretely, most of the time, that's exactly what we do, right? We do leakage detection, higher order attacks, and that is just based on estimation of the moments, which is not a good reason, right? Maybe, maybe the approach that we use at the moment for our evaluations are not completely sound, and we should question ourselves, but at least this gives some in incentive to look at, at that. Okay, so as usually, when you have something that's not completely sound, uh, the best thing that we can do is, is try to look what we can learn out of that. That's what we did first with simulations. So how does it look? This is a simulated example. On the top of the figure, you have um, in blue the sample distribution. So this is a, a chip that we simulate. And we had, in red, we have a biased model. Here it's very easy to see. You have an error in the mean. What do we see here on the second line? The estimation of all the moments. We see that indeed the means are different. What do we see? on the third line, the p-values. So this guy is telling us very rapidly, eh, impossible that this model is actually predicting the true chip distribution because, because we see there's a, there's a big difference in the means. And we can do that for the variances. We can do that for the skewness. We can do that for the kurtosis. What's interesting is, of course, it easily generalizes to mask implementation because typically this type of Gaussian mixtures that we have here this is what we would observe if we have a masking. Okay, that's simulation, uh, still not reality. So the next step was to look at, at what happens for real and um, first unprotected software because that's exactly what, what we did two years ago at, at Eurocrypt. So we wanted to repeat these experiments and we looked at, again, unprotected AES implementation in a very kind Atmelevier microcontroller. And this is what we get. So these figures, they are pretty much like the, the p-values figure. So I've just explained the, the upper left one. Um, this is for Gaussian templates and for the mean. The y-axis, you have 256 values, and these are the 256 templates that we built if we try to attack the output of the S-box. So these are our 256 models. And the x-axis is the number of measurements that, that we used in the evaluations. And in this case, we made an evaluation with up to 256,000 uh, measurements. What do we see is not much for the mean, not much for the variance, and that's pretty good news, huh? because that's essentially what we concluded two years ago. Gaussian templates were good enough in explaining this particular implementation, and we had a problem with a linear regression, because with a linear basis, the model was not good enough, and here again we see, well, clearly big errors, right? It's, it's, this model is not good, we need to change it, so good. What was maybe, I don't know, less good or surprising at least is, um, if you look at skewness and kurtosis, then we see there's a, there's a little bit of something, right? It's, it's, at some point, it seems that for some of the, the templates, we don't predict, predict the full distribution uh, nicely. So that's annoying because typically it could be kind of inconsistency between the previous approaches and this simplified one, uh, which is totally plausible, right? Because in the one case, we compare full distributions, we are, we are sound. In this case, we just estimate moments, so it's, it's a much simpler problem. Um, and yeah, we were wondering what happens here. 
And um, what we wanted to do at this point is, of course, to say, okay, maybe we have an error in the skewness or kurtosis, but maybe there's just nothing useful in these statistical moments. So the question becomes, do these errors lead to something? So, and to answer that, what we did is an additional test based on something very simple again, which is mom moments correlating DPA. So I guess you all know CPA, where you do correlation between the mean values and your actual leakages. Moments correlating DPA, you do the same but higher order. So you correlate higher order statistical moments with leakage samples here squared to a certain power, uh, raised to a certain power. And the, the cool thing with, uh, I think in general with correlation is that we have this nice metric intuition, which is the number of samples that you need to attack your implementation is inversely proportional to the square of the correlation coefficient. So what do we have? Um, first look at the top figure. This is the, the value of the, the moment correlating DPA for the mean, for the variance, skewness and kurtosis. And good news, we see there's very little information in the skewness and the kurtosis which seems very reasonable for an unprotected implementation, but now we see it, and that now backs up the, the results of your 2014. Um, so that's nice. What we have on, on this figure is exactly the same moments correlating DPA with Gaussian templates and linear regression. The only difference is that the moments are the ones that are produced by these models. And here it's nice as well because we see now, okay, we saw that there was a problem with uh, linear regression, and indeed uh, we see that the, the the amount of information that I have in the mean values produced by linear regression is less than the one of the template attacks. And obviously I also see there's a little bit of something in, in, uh, of information in the variance and this is lost when I do linear regression because we have this pooled variance or covariance matrix. So that's nice and we wanted to, and maybe it's still not very surprising or not very useful, so we wanted to move to something more challenging, and that was the mask hardware implementation. So one, one nice way to implement masking in hardware is threshold implementations. We, we took this example, and that's what we got. Um, I will take this line again. So this is Gaussian templates, no, no problems in the mean, no problems in the variance, clearly errors detected in the skewness and also in the kurtosis. And this time it's interesting because it's, it's a masked implementation. So there should be information there. So what did we, did we do? Again, moments correlating DPA. What do we see? Oh, good news. No information at all in the mean. So indeed, it is first order secure, hopefully. And then we see that we have information in the variance skewness and kurtosis. And I don't think we can say that this is negligible information. Okay, so here we really face a situation where this tool is telling us, well, you did Gaussian templates, but in fact, this is not enough. You should find something else if you want to extract all the information. And again, maybe slightly expected because Gaussian templates, they only cap capture mean and variance, as we know, we have higher order moments if we mask. But I think it's still nice to, to, to have this, this incentive now. Clearly, it, it tells us that for highly protected implementation or just protected implementation, we need more complex uh, models to explain what we see. Um, and there was just a paper by Tobias Schneider about uh, this was going to happen, about exactly that. Cool, so um, conclusion or wrapping up. I think the main the, yeah, conclusion is simple, right? It's a less formal, clearly, but probably more efficient and more intuitive tool. It's more efficient because essentially it's what you need to do is profile CPA many times. It's still costly, so I don't claim I would do that for all the points of your implementation, so I would still combine this with POI detection. But if you have a couple of points of interest and you want to, to test the model there, I think it's perfectly feasible with current uh, means. And, and the nice thing is it provides hints about the information loss, right? These moments correlating DPA tells us do we lose a lot, do we lose little? which we had not at all as an intuition where we, when we were using full distributions. Um, okay, we have a prototype open source code, so if you want to try exactly these experiments, univariate and so on, that's, that's uh, on this web page. And of course, there are open problems. I think the big one is how do we efficiently deal with, in the same time, highly multivariate attacks, just as the previous talk, and higher order um, distributions. That's something I don't think we have good tools for this at the moment. I think in general it's a hard problem. Um, the other thing what's, what's, I mean, seems questioning is, is this, this question, okay, we have model-based estimation or moment-based estimation, we have distribution-based estimation, is it enough to just look at, stati at statistical moments? 
I don't know, and maybe just a PS. Um, nothing like all these assumptions, are also, of course, it never happens if you do non-parametric -para PDF estimation. So if you go for kernels, for example, then you just have estimation errors. Maybe it's easier, but probably in, in the cases that we face, it's extremely expensive. And I just wanted to, to conclude with, with this slide, which shows that in the end, we have a kind of nice separation between engineering challenges like measurements and pre-processing. And I think there's no way to be sure that what we do is good for this part of the attacks because it's highly heuristic. So this, this we need continuous progress, but for all the rest, like for prediction, for modeling, for, for key enumeration, we reach the point where we have nice tools that are telling us, am I good enough? Is what I'm doing sound in a certain way? And that's it, thank you. Thank you.